The R32 Skyline GTR is one of the most iconic cars in the performance tuning world. It earned its name Godzilla in the early 90s, dominating Group A touring car racing globally and even forced the rules to be changed, giving it true motorsport heritage. Its reputation was further strengthened on the drag strips and streets of Japan, before Gran Turismo shot the car into the limelight once again and made it a halo car of the tuning scene. Its fearsome reputation of being able to dominate the street or track, either in a straight line or around corners, is as strong as ever, even more than 25 years since its debut, and it's still looked up to, respected and idolised. It is no secret that here at Motive DVD we are massive fans of the R32 GTR, with one of our own as a project car. So to celebrate the 25 year milestone, we have put together a special edition DVD containing our favourite R32 GTR feature cars and coverage. First import would have been my <laughs> automatic S13 CA turbo. Then my drift car, which was would, would have to be my R32. That was my street car, which turned into a drift car, which then went to DA and got thrashed and bashed and crashed into and crashed it into stuff. And that's what happens when you drift. I'm 33 now. I was old enough to actually see Bathurst and see them win at Bathurst. So I think in, in anyone that loves their, their Nissans, they would have grown huge love for us right away. We could talk for hours about the cars that Clint has built and driven, but we visited Western Australia to check out his R32, already famous in the Perth car scene. Clint's GTR has everything done right. Offset, stance, and nothing that ruins the lines and toughness of the R32. It also borrows from its younger GTR siblings. The paint is R35 Brilliant Red, and the Brembo brakes are from an R34. Around them are 19 by 9.5 inch Nismo LM GT4 wheels. They sit just right thanks to the Cusco Zero R coilovers and a host of adjustable arms. The handling improvement is pretty good too. Inside, an R34 also donated its front seats, adding a more modern feel, along with the Momo steering wheel and Alpine head unit, while some DEFI gauges give some extra information on what the engine is up to. But one of the main things that allows this car to leave an impression is the power and the sound. Oh, the sound. First, my first import, she had a three inch khaki motor exhaust. It had one mile for the back, it was so loud, but I didn't care. It's my little signature, along with my Southern Cross. They're my little signatures, so I always do those air intakes. And even with all my experience, I could say I've got enough experience in building cars, it still tested me. The first engine didn't last that long after motivation at the start of this year, and being the fact that it was a, for me a $10,000 weekend with two engines going in my cars just being 40 plus degrees, it just hurt me so much and uh, the car went home, parked in the shed and just left it there and if it wasn't for my fiance actually saying no, you're keeping this car, 
Um, I would have easily sold it for 10 grand, gotten rid of it. I have spent heaps of time, obviously, because I do it all myself. The only thing I don't do is I don't paint uh, and I don't tune. The legendary RB26 engine has been rebuilt and some HKS camshafts help it breathe more efficiently. The power and the sound comes courtesy of a Garrett GT35 turbo sitting on a six boost manifold running 1.2 bar thanks to a TurboSmart external wastegate. It sucks through one of Clint's sought after four into six inch intake pipes and dumps into a 90 millimeter Kakamoto exhaust system. Only the best for Clint's car with a Blitz intercooler, Coyo radiator, Gretti oil cooler, Saad rail with 850cc injectors, split fire coil packs and a Vipec ECU. Clint fabricated the cooler piping and there is plenty of custom braided lines and AN fittings around the place. All up, it's good for 500 horsepower at the hubs all day, every day. It's transferred through an ORC twin plate clutch with a Nismo rear diff centre. The best thing about the GTR is that you can decide whether to use the power for acceleration or burning tyres. moments when I first built this car when people said oh so when are you selling this one you don't build your dream car and sell it I, I realized after I sold the first one when I had to because of interest rates going up and I couldn't afford to keep it it was a car that I owned outright when I built this it's like well I can afford to keep this and uh, yeah I don't think my kids are having it I'll be still driving it then <laughs> Don't let his age and calm personality fool you. Shane is one of the most avid car enthusiasts in the land, and even more so, a Nissan junkie. His 180, Pure SX, has graced many a magazine, taken a houseload of trophies at Auto Salon, and competed in Series 2 of the Blood, Sweat and Gears TV show. But Shane is a GTR man through and through, and RB Ware, his second R32, is one of the cleanest and tastefully modified streetcars in Australia. Hello, my name's Shane Suda and welcome to Niz World. Used to be a Commodore guy, a Holden guy. After the kids all grew up, uh, didn't need Commodores anymore. Should have realised that earlier. So we bought a, a 180SX, had no idea what the hell it was really. And that was pretty much the biggest mistake of my life. Cost me a bloody fortune since then. It's been everywhere. It's been in magazines and videos around the world, America, England. Obviously Australia, I get emails from people asking how I did things and what I did and how I made things and what I've done to the car. It's changed my life basically from TV shows, obviously with blood, sweat and gears for that car. Um, yeah, it's, and it's made a massive amount of friends, not only in Adelaide, uh, Australia, but pretty much all around the world. And then you've got the GDR, which we built to pretty much cover all the bases. Uh, it's got some nice stuff on it. Uh, you can drive it shopping and the next day you can take it out on the track. The idea was to tr keep true to the GDR, you know, not change it too much. I think people sometimes change the GDRs too much. They get away from, from where it actually started. We wanted an all-round car. We wanted a car that we could do track, that we could do rallies with. A car that we could put in a car show for a bit of fun. An all-round car, a, a vers versatile car was really important to me. But beyond anything, true to the GDR brand. That's what it's all about. Trying to make an R32 GTR look better is an exercise that can backfire. 
Leopard Shane did it right by adding Nismo N1 front and rear lip spoilers, vents and side skirts along with Ganador mirrors and clear indicators. Matched with 18-inch work XD9 wheels, it's mission accomplished as the car looks the way a GTR is supposed to. Clean, purposeful and tough. Inside, Shane brought the interior into the 21st century with a custom leather retrim, carbon fibre trim pieces, blitz gauges and a basic stereo package. Who says you can't be comfortable and fast? Speaking of comfortable, the team coilovers mean the car can be driven every day on the street while remaining fast through the hills of Adelaide and on the track. Earlier this year we did uh, the Clipsal Rally, uh, leaving Victoria and finishing up the Clipsal race here in Adelaide. Uh, we've never done one before, so it was quite interesting. But it performed amazingly, it really did. It was probably one of the third, third fastest car in 50 cars, was cleaning up Porsches. And I think it really surprised a lot of people. You've got this old Nissan, you know, 94 Nissan, just whipping the ass of some of these Porsches. And uh, it shocks a lot of people. You know, we do a lot of track days with it, drive within the boundaries of the car, just enjoy it for what it is. You know, it just doesn't sit in a, in a garage all day. This thing's made to go and made to do what it does. The guy who built the motor, a, a drag racing guy out of New South Wales, I think he'd done an exceptional job, he really did. The guy who owned it before uh, had it commissioned, to, the, the motor commissioned to be built. He probably didn't have a lot of quality parts on it initially. He'd done the basics but didn't do all the fringe things, so I actually had to do that. With modern day stuff like turbos and cams and cam gears, change those to make it more reliable. I think the maintenance of the car's right, like every year, definitely drop all the fluids, a whole lot of them, keep the oil changes up. You know, it's like most things, you look after to look after you. Godzilla was born with two lungs and Shane has stayed true to this by using twin low mount turbos helping the rebuilt and forged RB26 make more power without sacrificing drivability and response. A Gretti intercooler and piping kit help it breathe while the fuel and cooling systems have been beefed up to cope and a Haltech Platinum ECU runs the show. It's good for just under 350 all-wheel kilowatts all day, every day. Doesn't seem massive until you consider they make less than half that from factory and the new R35 makes just under 300 at the wheels. An upgraded clutch and AP racing brakes up front and Brembo's at the rear means RB Wear can put the power down and pull up from the extra speeds. That's what it's there for, you know. It's, it's not the pretty car, okay. The, the 180 is a pretty car and that's fine, that's what it was built for. You see out of the engine bay and it hasn't got all the glittery chrome. It's, everything in there is made for a reason. The car is there to build to go around the track and when you've got this sort of power, it's not earth shattering but as you can see on the track it's still pretty sharp, you really need to stop. And, and it's just a case of some of the parts on the Nissan, even though you know they've done a great job with the car, being the age that it is, a 94, some of them you can just upgrade and not go too far away from where it started. Although the car was built as an all-round street car, like a GTR should be, it's a competent weekend track car. We got to see the car in action at the SAUSA Track Day at Malala Raceway. Street trim, including street tyres, RB Wear rips out low 1 minute 20 laps with ease all day and then drives home. Shane threw us the keys as well and we can vouch that it is one quick machine that is very well set up and a dream to drive on the street and at the track. It's so different. 
obviously with the 180 started it all for us uh, and gave us a bit of a profile which was great. People underestimate the 350. Super car, really are. And, and you can see by the 370 they've stayed with that Nissan has and uh, you know, made it a little bit better again. I'll never sell a car, no, no way in the world. My son wants it, that's not going to happen. It's not the most powerful, fastest or most modified GTR we've seen, but Shane's RB Wear is everything a GTR should be. He has successfully made everything that makes a GTR good even better, without sacrificing drivability, streetability and comfort. The BNR Series GTR may be dead, but long live the king. Power Cruise is a melting pot of all types of cars, and plenty of GTRs turn up to have a go, often dominating the off-street racing and cruise sessions. We've also seen them turn up in the drifting, dyno comps, even power skids a few times, and a couple have even entered the burnout competition. We've compiled some of our favourite GTRs and GTR moments at Power Cruise over the last five years. First up, let's take a look at a few cars in detail. Now the 24 Power Cruise that I've been to, I've driven a lot of very fast cars and been passenger even more, but I have to say my pick for this weekend, and I'd probably even say my pick of the best car I've ever driven would have to be this, it's Gav's R32 GTR. Why is it my pick? Not due to brutally ridiculous amounts of horsepower, but the fact that it has power, torque, the power delivery is perfect, response, chassis balance, handling, braking, you name it, in every way, this car is ridiculously fast and well engineered. G'day, my name's Gav from WA and this is my R32 GDR. I've worked very closely with X-Speed over the last, uh, I guess, 8 to 10 years on the car. So it's a 2.8 litre HKS engine and it's basically been built for track. So uh, we're running high compression, high capacity, small turbos, keeps it nice and linear with a modest 550 horsepower at four wheels. Really a combination of having good mid-range torque, enough power up the top end and of course four wheel drive doesn't hurt. It's all about having fun. The off-street racing that did well on the Thursday on the practice day Broke a standard gearbox, unfortunately. I should have known a bit better, but uh, thanks to the boys at X Speed working late last night, new gearbox in. Just tell myself, easy into third. I'm here at Power Cruise doing the drift demos. This is my GT. <laughs> and my GDR output. Hey, young guys, my name's Fernando Will from Sydney. I'm here at Power Cruise doing a drift demo in my. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hey young guys, my name's Fernando Will from Sydney. I'm here at Power Cruise doing the drift demo in my R32 GDR. No, that's good enough. This car I just bought off uh, Jeff from Triple S. He's been campaigning, I think, three years in um, the IPRA, which is the Improved Production Series. Um, I just bought it off him about a month ago. I've done two drift days in it. It's not a drift car, but it's, um, it doesn't do the job too badly, actually. Well, most punters would know the um, the old what is Scafey R32 GDRs from what is it 92, the uh, big big uproar where they banned all the Jap cars because they were just beating all the V8s. This car has actually got a Gibson motor in it. It's got a full Gibson setup. It's got the the Gibson block. Besides the power, uh, the turbo restrictors and, and the turbo sizing, it's actually everything else on the motor, around the motor is a Gibson motor. Jeff actually built this car pretty serious. I mean, it he, he didn't you know hold back on anything. Everything, is, everything he's done to it, he's done to the full extent. It's got like fire bombs, it's got the whole cage, it's been seam welded. I mean, you, you name it, and the car's pretty much got it thrown at it. Is I've actually read on a couple of forums already, who would, who would do something, uh, who would drift a car with IPRA uh, history? And I'm thinking, who would drift a car with Gibson history? Look <laughs> retarded. Got a bit of power to it and uh, just like having fun and um, 
beating my old school fans in the big car, so it's all good. of GTRs have taken out the off-street racing at Power Cruise events over the years. Let's take a look at a couple of R32s that got the job done. And the finals was an all GTR showdown of the original Godzilla versus the modern day. Let's get straight to the point. This GTR makes over 780 horsepower at the wheels on pump gas, over 850 horsepower on race gas, and over 930 horsepower at the wheels with a small hit of nitrous. Do whatever calculations you want, that's well over a thousand genuine horsepower at the engine. And it's in a full-bodied car with a complete interior, stereo, air conditioning, and a registration label. Now before you make any wrong assumptions, yes, it does get driven on the street, and yes, 
it can use the power. Watch. <laughs> Hi, I'm Robert Marjan, owner and driver of Jun R32. I already own a very quick Silvia, actually the quickest one in the world, um, also developed and uh, done by Jim at CRD. Uh, one of the quick street car, something I could take out whenever I want and enjoy it. Nick was the original owner of the car. He uh, built it at CRD and um, we were down in Canberra. There was a bit of street races going on and he goes, uh, Rob, do you want to take it for a drive? See how you go. So that was how I fell in love with the car. And from there, um, it was only a few months later, he said, I'm looking at selling it. I love the car, so I said, okay, and we uh, did a deal. When I first uh, bought it from Nick, it had 550 kilowatts with the original motor, and I used to park in the garage and drive it whenever I felt like it. Weekends, evenings, yeah, it was, uh, it was very uh, streetable, so to speak. I think we are in the back streets uh, of Minto one day, and um, there was a few cars there, and um, after the event, I think we crushed everyone's dreams. So that's where the name came from. The boys picked up on it. So how do the boys at CRD cook up a 1,000 plus horsepower RV26? Well, engine builder and tuner Jim Suvis won't give too many secrets away. But we can tell you it has a full Nitto 2.7 litre stroker kit, Nitto oil pump and drag head gasket and a CRD custom ported race head. The valve train specs are a bit hush hush, but rest assured it has no problem revving well past 10,000 RPM and is very very angry. The turbo is HKS's new top dog, the T62R, rated to 1100 horsepower. And the truss drag intercooler, Jun Plenum and 5 inch exhaust help make the most of it. 1650cc injectors and 3 Bosch pumps supply the juice and the nitrous system helps give a bit of extra kick. Everything's controlled by the Motec M800 and there's a Motec CDI in there with split fire coil packs. As I said back then when I bought the car from Nick, it had a dual motor, uh, hence the number plate. The motor now is a full Nido stroker, Nido uh, race head gasket and uh, Nido oil pump. Since then, we've put a new bigger turbo, uh, bigger exhaust system, we've got the five inch running now, T62. We've got 640 kilowatts, okay, on race fuel and I think 580 kilowatts at the wheels on pump gas. As far as I'm aware, it's the first car that they've had at that power level. They've got plenty of cars out there with, Nido, with, with the Nido strokers and other Nido, Nido parts. Okay, but at the power level, it hasn't, you know, it's been perfect. It's gone through rigorous testing, okay, and trumps, you know, beautiful. It hasn't missed a beat. Now the plans for the car is to remain a street car, no cage. Uh, we, we do want to take it to the track, Western Sydney. Uh, we have one crack at it, so we'll, we'll give it everything it's got and uh, see what we come out with. An OS Geek and sequential six-speed gearbox, quad plate clutch, and mechanical front and rear diffs put the power to the ground. AP six-piston front and four-piston rear brakes make sure Jun can pull up after a run, and they are found inside 17-inch R33 GTR rims, which are wrapped in Mickey Thompson ET streets at the rear and Nitto NT triple fives at the front. The interior is very basic, with just Nismo gauges and a Motec mini dash and shift light. As tough as Jun looks, the only exterior mods are the clear indicators, Ganador mirrors and carbon front lip. At the airport what I found was uh, the traction was down, you know, on the street it's much better. The first two runs I had, first, second and third gear, full on wheel spin, couldn't get it to um, grip, into fourth gear and that's when it started going. I think uh, with a better surface we'll be well deep into the nights. At our GTR Challenge, Jun was able to put down a 10.0 second pass at 150 miles per hour. That's a 10 second car in street trim, on street tyres and on a street surface. Even scarier is the 3.1 second 0 to 100 time and Jun hit 200 kilometres per hour from rest in 7.3 seconds. Now to put that into perspective, Rob's daily driven 500 horsepower R34 does the quarter mile in 12.3 seconds at 118 miles per hour, 
and reaches 200 kilometers an hour in 14.5 seconds. That's right, Jun hits 200 kilometers an hour from rest in half the time of a 500 horsepower R34 GTR. We use performance figures from Motor Magazine as a comparison to some new cars. A stock Evo 10 takes 24.4 seconds. Australia's fastest saloon does 200 kilometers an hour in 18.5 seconds. A Lamborghini Gallardo does it in 12 and a half, and a Porsche GT2 takes 12 seconds flat. None of them any match for Jun. Not even close. Well, what about a Veyron? The Bugatti hits 100 kilometers an hour in 2.5 seconds with a perfect full traction launch. But after 7.3 seconds, Jun has taken the lead, beating the Veyron to 200 kilometers an hour. So there we have it. Jun is quicker than any production car money can buy. If anyone wants to prove it's wrong, feel free to put up the challenge. Motive DVD is expanding the way you can view to suit your lifestyle and budget. Motive DVDs and Blu-rays are available from our online store as well as various outlets and there are box sets, specials and pre-orders available. Our website is also growing with more news, reviews and features online as well as information on all of our tours including SEMA and Tokyo Auto Salon. As well as our free YouTube channel that you can subscribe to, we have now launched a paid subscription channel where you can watch all Motive DVD issues for just a small monthly fee. Via YouTube, you can then watch it on your smart TV, mobile device, laptop, computer. In fact, you can watch YouTube on almost anything. We are also launching a Vimeo pay-on-demand system that will enable you to digital download individual features as well as rent each individual issue of Motive DVD. This means you can now watch Motive DVD pretty much anytime, anywhere and on any device. For more information, head to our website, motivedvd.com. Now, as many of our viewers would already know, I'm a little bit of a Nissan junkie. But further to that, the R32 GTR Skyline has always been, and will always be, my favourite car. So when Terry and the guys from SAU New South Wales decided to put on a 21st anniversary birthday bash for the R32, we dropped everything and made sure we were here to check it out. The first meeting point for the event was in Penrith, nice and early on a lovely Sunday morning. As we're surrounded by highly modified R32 GTRs, you're probably wondering why we're about to take a look at a completely standard one. Well, as we all know, in the last 10 years in Australia, collectible cars' prices have gone through the roof. And there are two things that make a car collectible, rarity or motorsport heritage. And this car has both. Now, the R32 GTR was sold in Australia, but only 100 examples were bought in, and only 96 of them were registered. And this one was the very first one, and it was owned by Mark Scaife. That's right, it was his personal car. Now, while we're here, let's take a look at some of the things that easily and quickly distinguish an Australian delivered GTR from a normal Japanese one. Now, at the front, you have a Nissan badge on the front of the bonnet. Up on the roof, you have what is probably the ugliest aerial you can ever put on a car, but that is how you distinguish these on the outside. And if you look on the inside, the main difference is the Australian delivered GTR came with a 260 km per hour speedo. It's the only one that did. With all hands on deck, the crew set sail, with cars sent off in groups determined by model of car. 
of course, with the R32s first. Since we didn't have an R32 of our own, we whacked a camera in Graham's tough GTR. We set ourselves a lot longer period to get this going. Three months in the making. The R34 GDR was six weeks in the making. We actually had the R32 GDRs all around Australia. There's some from Victoria, there's some from ACT. There's guys here from Queensland, as well as country New South Wales, and they're all into it. I mean, we all have one common theme. They're in there watching the movie now, the 92 Bathurst 1000. They're going to hit with the double climax at the end. Uh, not just who won it, but also the speech. We've got 100 cars. I mean, from interstate, everyone's enjoying themselves to the max. It hasn't been um, a, a day for drivers, tracking, drifting. Um, it's been a family day. You see those pictures of those R32s today, and you can go over them again and again and again. And long after my words are finished and forgotten, those images will be with you for all time. Now, I've got a little bit of an interesting fact for all of our viewers out there. If you didn't already know, the name Godzilla was not given to the skyline by the Japanese or anyone from Nissan. It was, in fact, given to the car by us, Australians. The guys at Wheels Magazine, when the skyline went on sale in Australia, they called it Godzilla. Why? Because it was from Japan and it was terrorising everything in its way. So ever since then, the name Godzilla has stuck and it's a pretty damn good one. With some of New South Wales and ACT's best skylines on show, we had to take a look around. Now, we looked at the Australian-delivered R32 GTR that's here, and it's quite rare, one of 96. But the rarest GTR today here has to go to this, the Nismo R34 GTR Z-Tune. This thing is number one of 19, and if you include the press car, there's only 20 of these cars in the world, and two of them are here in Australia. Now, even ignoring the number plates, when you cruise through the car park here and check out the GTRs, one car stands out as clearly the toughest one here. And coincidentally, it actually belongs to probably the toughest guy here as well. Graham, how you doing, mate? Good, mate. Yourself? <laughs> yeah, pretty good. Now, it's been off the road for a little while. Where's it been? It actually done an oil pump at uh, Power Cruise three years ago. And, yeah, we just rebuilt it ever since then. So it's been ongoing and ongoing and ongoing, and that's it now. But you certainly gave it a little bit more than before, right? Yeah, we went um, big, big. Now I have to point out a little bit of irony about today's event. It's the 10th of October and most motorsport enthusiasts around the country are currently glued to their TV watching Bathurst. But not us. We're here at a cinema in Katoomba to watch the 1992 Bathurst race. Why? Because it was won by an R32 GTR Skyline. Then it came down to the final two. Mark Gibson, the GIO GTR, and Mark Scaife for the number one machine. Jamboree is the world's biggest and best sports compact drag racing event. GTRs have come and gone, but a few regulars have made a big name for themselves. 
In the early days, we used to see Theo Woolett in the Castro Edge GTR laying down some big skids and going head to head with Mark Jacobson in the Godzilla Motorsport R32 before his car stepped up a few notches and ended up in the mid sevens before being retired. The world's quickest R32 and quickest GTR is still the Heat Treatments R32 from New Zealand. Yesterday uh, we, we ran in the modified compact division, qualified with a 777. I haven't checked it yet but the guys have told me that that's number one qualifier. Um, so we're just going to have to wait and see how the day goes. Really with this car I want to get it down into sort of the 740 zone and uh, once, once I've got there that's sort of where you know, I'd be happy with. If it runs any faster than that, well that's just... Um, a bonus you know but um, after that we, we've got another car in the build at the moment the car's actually finished but uh, the engine needs to be dynoed and plus it needs to be reliable before we bring it here and we're, we're a fair way away from that yet. With Mark Jacobson out the only serious GTR keeping Reese company was the R32 of Matthew Earl from North Queensland. It resembles a street car more than a race car, but 890s with an H pattern box is certainly something special. I had a lot of support from yeah, obviously my girlfriend and my mother, but um, got a lot of knowledge from uh, Mark from Godzilla Motorsports. You know, he's been wonderful and uh, gave us a lot of secrets and a lot of ideas that took him, you know, seven years to uh, come up with and uh, things that he's tried and proven and broken and destroyed, and we've sort of gone straight into the good stuff. and. Uh, hopefully see some good times out of the car. Brent White in the Mercury Motorsport R32 GTR, Nito 2, resetting the world radial tyred GTR record, running a 795 and going over 180 miles per hour. <laughs> At Just Car Insurance, we're into imported, high-performance and modified cars. So if it's not just a car and you want comprehensive insurance that offers easy pay-by-the-month premiums, call Just Car Insurance on 13 13 26 or buy a new policy online and save 50 bucks. Some say that to know where you are going, you first need to understand where you've been. For this, Nissan has their heritage collection, also referred to as the Nissan DNA Museum. It's not open to the general public, but the D-Sport and Motive DVD Tokyo Auto Salon Tour had exclusive access to check it out. After an overview of the history of the Nissan Motor Company, it was into the vault with some ex-Nissan engineers that worked on the R32 GTR Road and Group A cars. Talk about the perfect tour guides in GTR owner heaven. Uh, welcome to Zama Heritage Collection. I'm Makazu Hiyoki. I joined Nissan in 1969 and starting from my uh, engine, engine designer. Finally, I uh, signed as uh, manager of Motorsports in 1988. Since then, I 
fully you know work with the motorsports. Then I you know work for to design this uh, Sky GTR 32 GTR Group A car, racing car, and the Group N uh, production car. Also the GTIR Pausa, you know rally cars for international event. This uh, facility is uh, the Nissan owned car. It's uh, around more than we have more than 400 units. Uh, out of 100 units is for the motorsports, rally car and racing car. Then, uh, unfortunately, the size is not so big enough. That's why we not only have 250 units in this uh, facility. Since, uh, since I uh, got a driver's license, I love uh, 510 and then 240Z, uh, and of course uh, Skyline, Skyline GTR, all three cars. I love it. Hey what's up guys, my name is John from Auckland, New Zealand and this is my R32 GDR. Since the first day when I was a little kid and whatnot, playing PlayStation games and all the arcade games and there was only one car that stuck out the most from all the others and it just dominated everything that you put it up against, you know, all the Mitsi, Subarus, Lamborghinis, you name it, and it just overlapped them. And as I was growing up, there was a big, all the heat treatments, racing guys all coming up and about, and all the guys from Australia. And I thought to myself, one day I've got to own one of these. So I kept looking, kept looking, then found this one here. Well, basically, I just took it a step at a time. I, I was hoping to get something nice and powerful that would dominate anything on the road. It's um, street legal vehicle, so I, I wanted to do everything uh, perfect. I took my time off a lot of things, um, all the parts. I didn't want to get anything with Chinese or anything like that. I had to save a lot more, obviously, being Japanese parts. If you know what, how much they cost and how much of a dent they put in your pocket. So it took a fair bit of time. You know, it's, it's been five years now since the first modification went into it. The name Godzilla was given to the R32 GTR when it arrived in Australia and dominated Group A touring cars. The name stuck, but even after the car was banned from racing, its reputation continued to grow both on the street, the circuit and the drag strip. The car now holds cult status. Take a look at it, you know it means business. John enhanced the aggressiveness with top secret front and rear diffusers and a set of 19 inch Nismo GT4 wheels. John might be power hungry and the car might look the goods, but he also wanted it to handle as well. So HKS Hypermax 3 coilovers were installed along with an array of Cusco, Nismo and Whiteline suspension parts. Braking has also been improved with Wheelwood six piston calipers up front along with upgraded pads and rotors all round. Inside, it's just what it needs. 320 km an hour speedo, an array of gauges and some harnesses. But there is no denying the real attraction of this car is the engine bay. The special thing about the T51R turbo kit was the noise that it made. Oh, I just fell in love with it. I used to watch videos countless hours on YouTube, motive DVDs and all the other car shows you can think of and the noise that they make, you can't go past it. 
The HKS T51R Turbo Kit not only sounds good, it makes great power as well, but it needs a strong engine to handle it, which John certainly has. Semi-grout field, CP pistons, Carrillo rods, ready oil pump, HKS head gasket and valve train inside a fully balanced and blueprinted RB26. The support gear for the T51R kit starts with an HKS high power exhaust system and type R intercooler and then into the Greddy inlet manifold. Instead of attacking a refinery, Godzilla needs one in this case. With a surge tank, braided lines and aeromotive pump in the boot, an HKS fuel rail filled with a thousand cc injectors in the engine bay. There's also split fire coil packs and an alloy radiator. It's all controlled by an HKS FCON Pro-V ECU and makes 531 kilowatts with the wick turned up to two bar of boost. More than enough power to back up the Godzilla name. The drivetrain is upgraded with an OIC triple plate clutch and HKS torque split controller. Um, I'm still not finished. I'm eventually going to put a six point roll cage in it with crossbars and whatnot. It'll still be road legal once that's done. Um, so it's, it's awesome. Once I've got that roll cage in there, I'm pretty happy. Well, the one thing I would like to do after the roll cage is hopefully a dog box if my wife will let me. Um, I've got to kind of sweet talk her for that. So um, one step at a time, I guess. What is your first memory of Japanese tuning culture? The vision or moment that you became hooked. For many, it was watching massive horsepower GTRs scrambling for traction and running 9 and 10 second quarters on street tyres back in the late 90s and early 2000s. This GTR makes all those younger day memories come flooding back, as this car is what the Jap street scene was all about. It's OG JDM. at it, you'd guess that it was built in Japan, and you'd be right. The car was built by Aki Fuchigami, owner of Garage Bomber, almost 10 years ago, but it now resides in Southern California. I owned a tuning shop in Japan before, mm -hmm. about uh, nine years ago. Mm -hmm. Then I did a 10 years tuning shop. Then I built, a, I built a lots of GTR, then some cars in the UK, or yeah, some cars here. Uh, this weekend, hopefully, nine second middle. Mm -hmm. Then try to switch the tires next year, maybe. Then try to eight second car. So what is it about this GTR that makes it look so right? You can't really put your finger on it. It just looks so purposeful, so aggressive. It all starts with a gritty body kit, headlight duct, a Jun vented hood and veil side mirrors. The car was slightly widened and stitch welded before it was sprayed in House of Colour Chameleon. We've seen this paint on many a tacky show car, but on this car, it looks unreal. But it's the little things that make it look so right. The holes cut out in the front bar, the hood and trunk pins, the twin exit exhaust, and we love the Boost Lee number plates. The look is set off by the 17 by 9.5 inch Volk TE37s wrapped in BF Goodrich drag radials. Inside them are Brembo F50 brakes and the stance is set right by HKS Hypermax drag coilovers. There's also a host of adjustable arms to help get the geometry correct. Inside it's all business. Stripped, caged, race seat and harness keep Arky safe or the Greddy gauges keep him informed. The wiring's all been redone and there's a HKS torque split controller, drag controller and a line lock kit for you know what. He even does the burnouts the way we remember them from the old days in Japan.
burnout server purpose to warm the tyres and let the car do this. That's right, you're reading correct. This GTR runs nines on radial tyres with no nitrous and in a car that isn't that far removed from a road car. That's what the GTR is all about. So what's underneath? It's all quite simple, really. The fully built RB26 with all Tomei internals is still 2.6 litres, but revs beyond 9,000 RPM. Rest assured, there's plenty of tricks and secrets inside to keep it together as it makes 900 horsepower with boost only, supplied by the HKS T51R SPL Turbo Kit. It dumps into a garage bomber custom exhaust and blows through a gritty intercooler and 100mm throttle body into the modified Group A intake manifold, which now houses 12 550cc injectors. They're fed by three Bosch fuel pumps and are controlled by the HKS FCON-V Pro ECU. Power is channelled through a HKS triple plate clutch and six-speed dog box to the Tomei rear diff and Cusco front. The combination doesn't seem that crazy, but it sure does work and the car is awesome to watch. So less talk and more action. Superlap and then World Time Attack Challenge has showcased Australia's fastest time attack cars and the R32 GTR has turned up every year. In fact, you could say that time attack in Australia started with one particular time attack car, the high octane racing R32, which headed to Japan to compete in late 2007 and the first Superlap event was held in 2008, where the car came second outright before it was sold and then driven by the new owner in 2009. I'm right, here with Dave Williams, who is the proud new owner of the famous R32 GDR from Mark Berry's camp. How does it feel to now own this piece of, well, piece of Japanese history in Australia, really? Yeah, look, I mean, it's been a great thing. I mean, you know, I'm pretty fortunate that I was the one that picked the car up. Um, you know, the boys have had it for a long time. They've set it up from zero, you know, to what it is now. And, you know, I've stepped into a great car, so it makes it easy for me. You know, I've just got to learn how to drive it. <laughs> yeah, I basically heard it, heard that the guys had had it for sale. Um, I've got a R34 that I've done as a street car as well, which I was doing at the time through Ian. He sold me a lot of the parts. Ian told me about the car, so um, I rang Mark, had a chat to him over the phone. Anyway, I said to Mark, you know, just ask a few questions about the maintenance and that of the car, what it was, you know, what, what it entailed. And um, I said that, you know, I lived in Cairns and obviously logistics of the car, we don't have a track up there, so it had to stay in Brisbane. They were quite happy to keep it in the shed, look after it for me, because it's still their baby. And I said, look, I'm quite happy with that. And um, so, yeah, flew down, um, took the car out to Morgan Park, yeah, did a couple of laps in it, and said, mate, it's a deal. I've been in the car three times, so <laughs> twice in Brisbane. Um, I did a time attack day with Paul, um, just on a Wednesday, and then I did a practice Saturday. And then, um, yeah, so, and then Iron Park, like this first, yesterday was the first time I had a look at the track, so I was trying to get the car sort of set up, you know, like having a look at the track, you know, getting used to it, and so um, played with a few little things, and um, yeah, and then today, yeah, we've got a problem with the, um, it's done a coil pack, so the first two sessions I've done, we had, yeah, two spark plugs fail, so now we've worked out what the problem is, so, but yeah, I did a 116 in that last session, so. That's not bad for your first time at Iron Park. Five cylinders. We jumped on board for a lap with Dave, and even with him still getting used to the car, and it's still suffering from a small misfire, he continued to get faster throughout the day.
running a 1 minute 15.8 by the end of the day, keeping him in the top 10 overall. Not bad for his first time at Oran Park. Mark Berry then bought the car back and drove the car in open class in 2012. But plenty of other GTRs have entered World Time Attack Challenge across all categories. went to another new build, the wild carbon R32 GTR of Chris Alexander. This car was built in secret, and when video and pictures of it surfaced in testing pre-event, many were keen to see this wild machine in action. Chris managed a 1 minute 32.991, and we've heard that since the event, the car has now gone much quicker up in Queensland. <laughs> World Time Attack Challenge has also enabled fans to see the Group A R32 GTRs hit the track as part of the Turbo Legends display. One of the big crowd favourites is the Group A R32 GTRs. This year, we got to jump on board the GIO Skyline for a lap. The car is still used in race events but, being an exhibition, Rod Markland is taking it easy. This is the first time that we've uh, come to World, World Time Attack. We've brought a R32 GDR Skyline. Yeah, it's making good growth. We made 555 rear wheel kilowatts. BC Automotive, we're located in Victoria, Lilydale. A small shop, a couple of teams, there's three of us in the team. Um, a lot of our background is in tuning and uh, race car preparation. So we do a bit of a combination of, of building vehicles, Aussie muscle cars, Monaros, that sort of stuff. Um, but we also prep and build yeah, a number of race cars. Um, and yeah, Time Attack, we are interested in the Time Attack and that's sort of what led us to build the, the 32. Being our first time here, um, you know, we've sort of come up to find out what the event's all about. We've followed it pretty heavily you know, on the social media side of things, but we've come up here to find out what the racing's about, where the competition's at, um, and sort of what we need to do as a team in a business to be competitive. Um, yeah, and ultimately we've come up here to put a good time down. Uh, we tested last Wednesday prior to coming up here and um, had some really good results. We managed to crack 300 kilometres an hour at Phillip Island, you know, which is fairly, um, fairly impressive. Hitting 300 kilometres an hour at Sydney Motorsport Park requires some serious power. Providing it is an RB26, strengthened and stroked thanks to a Nitto 2.8 litre stroker kit. A dry sump system, N1 water pump and PWR coolers keep it alive. Boost comes from a Precision 6466 sitting on a six boost manifold with the upgraded fuel and ignition systems controlled by the Motec M800. 
a PPG dog engagement gear set with Hollinger flat shift gear knob and Exidy twin plate clutch transfer that power to the ground. And underneath, it's teen coilovers, custom sway bars, a host of adjustable arms, plus some little tricks. AP racing brakes sit inside the 18 by 10 and a half inch TE37 wheels and aero and bodywork were all custom made or modified. Inside, it's all business, stripped and caged with a MoTeC digital dash. It all seems quite simple, but the package most certainly works. Uh, today, good day, first time here. Um, so what we've done today is gone out, we did a half a lap in the first session, red flag, so we um, just took a bit of data from that, went out the next session, we got a good lap in, um, we did a 33 flat, which has put us um, put us a second ahead of the vision car, the GoPro car. It's kind of where we want to be. Um, had a bit of an issue with the selector in the gearbox, so we're now just going to um, shoot across one of the boys' workshops, pull that out, sort that out. We know what it is, so we'll fix it. Back here tomorrow, get out in the morning early, cold, smash out a pretty good time, I hope. I had a pretty rough morning, we were pretty quick yesterday, um, had some dramas this morning with the car, never got a lap in the first two sessions, little things, we had an ignition coil fail, um, gear selection problems yesterday, but a bit worried about the track going off in the afternoon and we'd already used our green tyres this morning, but I um, psyched myself up a bit on the way down the straight, a bit of yelling at myself and all that, and uh, pumped out an okay lap and uh, I was counting down on the way down the straight watching the timer on the dash and our uh, 31.7 came out so can't ask more than that, it was enough to do the job so pretty happy. For the time of day and used tyres I didn't think it would have done that or I could have done that but um, no, nah, she's a rocket. We were third, um, done a 33.0 uh, so we we're a fair way behind the win uh, but to pull that out and to get for the guys to get the car going that well it's just been amazing so as our first time here, even as a spectator, never been here, and to take it out like that against this competition, we're absolutely stoked. Just, I'm a mechanic who's always worked on race cars and had my own race cars, but um, working at BC Automotive and having Steve Arnorellis own the car, he's a customer of ours, 
and uh, let me drive the car. So um, we put a big effort in to get it here. And, um, a couple of times we thought we weren't going to make it, and uh, here we are, we won it. So, um, yeah, stoked. I've owned two GDRs and a GDST. I, I bought it to just cruise in to some Nasho Park runs and Cars Creek and stuff like that, just go cruising and the engine let go. I've always wanted to build a big motor GDR, so I thought this is my chance. And then um, I bought a gearbox off this guy called Steve Carr. And then from there on it just went track, track weapon, had to be a track car. I wanted the street slash track car just so I can cruise it on the weekends and we never want to do a track day, just do a track day. And uh, yeah, that's, that's where it started and uh, then it turned into a pretty mean drag car. Or oh, no, a street slash drag car really, yeah, so it was a... I wanted to build that black car into the time attack car and then I started doing some sums. Tom put a cage in, an aero and this and that. Chris Anderson's car come up and I thought, oh, I'll grab that, it just saves us a lot of time. That was it. It was, it was a time thing and again, we sat down, spoke to Chia, can we do this? And he, uh, he got the boys together and he assured me that this car will be ready for time attack and as you guys can see, it's, it's ready. Well, the original plan was engine like my the, the bits out of my black car in to get it running and then uh, the guys all put their heads together and said uh, let's try this let's try that and they tried a few things and uh, they just got out of hand like like most builds do and it was like just let's let's do this you know and uh, lucky enough we had Steve's car there we could always fall back on and uh, steal bits from his or steal set up from him so uh, it made, made, out, made my car an easier build, I think, personally, but I didn't do the work, so I can't really comment on that. <laughs> Buying a time attack car minus running gear was a smart move for Resi. The shell was already stripped, caged, and sporting top stage carbon doors, bonnet, and aero, although it has since been updated to version 3 spec. Powertune also built the rear diffuser and the new lower guard and side skirt aero. Powertune also installed the top stage carbon dash and modified the tunnel to suit the new gearbox. Underneath, the car was already equipped with IKEA formula control arms, sway bars and super pro bushes, as well as the monster Alcon brakes front and rear. The Powertune team added BC ER coilovers to suit their specifications. Dennis put his 18 by 10.5 inch TE37s on and the job was done, saving plenty of time and money in stripping a complete car and starting from scratch. The fresh new look comes courtesy of the Cars movie inspired rap. A look that Dennis's car is now known for. Oh, the Cars theme, it all comes down to my daughter. She's a, she's a massive fan. Oh, she was a massive fan now, she's into Frozen. So by the time I uh, got the car around to looking like Lightning McQueen, she was like, uh, oh, McQueen, you know, whatever, you know. Now, now, I think if I did her up as Elsa or Anna, she'd be more impressed, but uh, it was all about impressing my daughter. 
The main job building this car was transplanting the running gear from Dennis's black car, although that changed slightly with the switching to an Albans ST6 gearbox matching his teammate Steve Carr. The engine is a sleeve 2.8 litre RB26 with Brian Crower internals with a power tune stage one head and has a custom dry sump system. The popular combo of six boost exhaust manifold and turbo smart external wastegate supports the precision 6766 turbo which blows through plasma man piping and intercooler into a Gretti inlet manifold. Injector Dynamics ID 2000s pump E85 from the Gretti fuel rail and there is an aeromotive reg, all with braided lines. A Koyo radiator, Setrab oil cooler and Nismo thermostat take care of cooling and the new Howtech Elite ECU controls the show and is wired up with a Howtech smart wire kit. The Powertune team tuned the car to 535 all-wheel kilowatts on 32 psi. So now, Dennis has a car as fast as his black one while going around corners too. The original intention was I would be driving it. I was happy with the 35. That, that was it. I wanted to enjoy the car and drive it. And I spoke to Dean Lilly and I said, oh, if, if there's a chance you want to jump in and drive it. He was like, yeah, yeah, I'm keen on that. And uh, so we went out on the, the uh, Thursday practice session and we were just trying out a different um, wing. We want to try out two different wings on the back of the car. And Dean jumped in and whipped out a 31.8 off the bat and he turned to me and goes, dude, this car's quick. And uh, that was, that's when I went, all right, Dino, do you want to win this? And he goes, yes. So that's when I just stepped back and uh, I let Dino do the driving abilities and I was just there to help. Steve was stressed out, but we're mates and uh, look, we're both supportive of each other. I think Steve was the first bloke to come up to me when, I went, when Dino cracked the uh, 30.9 and took the lead. Steve was the first one to give me a hug, you know, shake hands and give me a hug. So, look, all the way through these builds, we were never rivals. We were always about a team. But a one-two finish is awesome. But yeah, as mates, I think it was, even when Steve got me at the end, I was like, ah, oh, bummer. But I was happy for him as well, you know. I, I personally think Steve deserved it more than me. Because <laughs> I copied a lot of his shit. <laughs> Well, I want to develop the car more. I think I think the car's got a few more seconds in it, or hopefully a few more seconds, but that's the aim, to get it quicker. Um, I'd like to be driving it a bit more, so uh, when Time Attack comes around, if I'm, if I'm capable to drive it fast, I will. If I'm not, I'll probably hand it over to Dino again, but I don't really want to hand it over to Dino. I actually want to have a shot at it myself. I probably won't go, I, I can guarantee it won't go as fast as Dino, but just a personal goal. Just the person I've, I've, I've raced bikes for a lot of my life and I'm a racer at heart so I want to do something, I want to achieve something. My plan was to do time attack anyway but I wasn't planning to go that far, I was just playing my black car, cruiser, drive there, drive back, do a 35, that was my aim and uh, everyone knows the bug when you start, it just don't, doesn't stop mate, it doesn't stop, it just keeps going so it's, uh, it's a good thing, people say oh was it worth it, I think it is. I've spent a lot of money, but who cares?
you sounding great now. <laughs> For less friction, change your engine oil to new one. For Motive fans, our R32 GTR project car should be quite familiar, with the entire build available to watch for free on our YouTube channel. But for those new to Motive, a quick recap. The car was purchased as a 30th birthday present to myself in 2011. Cheap and nasty. The plans to leave it as is and just drive it didn't last long with the engine letting go after three days. Welcoming me to true GTR ownership. A crashed R32 was purchased cheap that turned out to be a gold mine of parts and one car was created with the best parts from both and project budget supercar was born. The aim was always to build a GTR with supercar performance on a modest budget, only changing what had to be changed, all while keeping the car looking fairly stock and having almost factory levels of drivability. The car has now reached the end of stage one. Did we meet our goal? We think so. But before we start stage two, let's take a look at the end result. The exterior is as Nismo intended it to be. If it's good enough for Group A racing, it's good enough for us. N1 boot lip spoiler, spats and bumper vents. We also added a vented bonnet for better cooling through the negative pressure ducts and also has an N1 bonnet lip built in. The wheels are R34 GTR items chosen for being forged and lightweight, made by Ray's Engineering, and they give a more factory look. They are wrapped in Achilles 123S 26535 tyres, one of our favourite street tyres. Behind them are R33 GTR Brembos, upgraded with Nismo brake pads, slotted and dimpled rotors, braided brake lines, and Castrol SRF racing brake fluid. They look factory, don't break the bank, and work very well stopping in as little as 33 metres. Supercar performance. For the suspension, we worked with Fulcrum Suspension in Queensland using their Teen and Super Pro products to put together a package designed for the road, enabling daily drivability comfort while also giving supercar rivaling handling through the twisties. Stiff coilovers can ruin a GTR's comfort, handling and even braking and traction, so it's important to get the setup right. EDFC controllable Team Super Street was selected along with adjustable caster rods and rear camber arms as eccentric bolts don't give enough adjustment. Rather than using rose jointed arms for everything, we instead replaced every single bush in the car with Super Pro polyurethane items. It made the steering and suspension in the car feel brand new and offers improved suspension compliance without the harshness of rose joints. Super Pro Roll Control Adjustable Sway Bars also got the nod and we installed Roll Center Adjusters. Overall, the package gives daily driven comfort but with supercar rivaling handling through the twisties and the ability to run 1.65 60 foot times on street tires. Once again, supercar performance. Inside, it all appears factory. Keen eyes will notice the different gear shifter while the four-wheel drive controller and high-low boost switch is hidden away. Now on to the engine. A stock R33 GTR item means it has the improved crank collar and a higher rev limit. Other than checking the bearings before going in the car, the long block is as it left the Nissan factory. All we did was add a baffle to the factory stump and baffled rocker covers to help with oil control. The turbos were custom made by GCG turbochargers and used Garrett GT2860-5 internals inside Dash 7 housings. Think of them as high flow Dash 7s. The aim was to have N1 turbo response but with the ability to make more power. 
mission accomplished on that one. The factory manifolds have been port matched. X-Force open dump pipes, 3 inch front pipes and 3.5 inch system is pretty straightforward. The car also came with an HKS intercooler, hard piping kit and Apexi pod filters that we hid under an airbox for legality in New South Wales. Adjustable cam gears and Tomei drop-in pond cams were added in fairly early in the engine development. We pushed the standard airflow meters with the power of C to nearly 330 kilowatts at the wheels, but the inconsistencies in the tune due to maxed out airflow meters after 280 kilowatts, combined with the lack of engine protection from the power of C, meant that we switched to a Howtech Platinum plug and play ECU along with a flex fuel sensor and electronic boost controller. We modified the factory rail to be twin entry using the factory fuel lines as feeds and adding a Dash 8 return line along with a turbo smart fuel pressure regulator to handle the higher fuel flow. Bosch 1100cc injectors sit in the rail and an aftermarket industry surge tank and Holly Dominator pump combo means we will never run out of fuel. We saw as much as 350 kilowatts on pump fuel, but kept it on 330 kilowatts for safety. But the switch to E85 saw power jump everywhere and peak power up to 383 kilowatts. On 330 to 350 kilowatts, the stock head studs and head gasket were fine. But once we started running 383 kilowatts, the factory head studs had begun to stretch and the head started to lift so will need to be upgraded to stage two. It's a common problem that we knew was coming. Cooling is improved with a Koya radiator and trust oil cooler hidden under the carbon cooling panel. The car used an NPC single plate clutch and factory fire speed for quite a while and they survived two years and hundreds of launches on 330 kilowatts. But once power was raised to 383, it cried enough. We switched to a direct clutch services twin plate at the same time we switched to the car's piece de resistance and R34 GTR 6 speed jet drag transmission. It is still mated to the factory 4.1 diffs, so it has very close ratios and has totally transformed the car. What was once quite laggy due to the factory long gear ratios in the 5 speed is now a responsive weapon. It is quite possibly the best modification you can do to a street or circuit GTR. As is, the car ran a 10.9 second pass at 131 miles per hour on a 30 plus degree day no less. In the cooler winter air, the car has run as fast as 136 miles per hour. On a street surface at Kudamundra Airport, the car has run 11.0 and 0 to 100 times of under three and a half seconds. Supercar performance. So it accelerates, stops and handles in line with most supercars on the market, all with mods that don't break the bank too much and can still be used to take the kids to school, or in my case, my daughter to daycare. So now it's time for stage two. Stay tuned to our YouTube channel. In 2009, Motive DVD held its first GTR challenge at Kudamundra Airport. The first event was pretty low key with just Croydon Racing Development's customers. But the idea of thrashing on a runway was rather appealing and the event grew to include the drag battle event in 2010 and has grown in size and speed every year. The toughest street GTRs in Australia come every year to battle it out on a street surface. Let's take a look at some of our favourite R32s from the Motive DVD GTR Challenge. I'm Dominic from Auto Style Performance Cars, and this is one of our R32 GDRs, Fumi. To get the car to this event, it has been a mission for sure. Uh, we only had about a week's notice, and the car was actually getting a different engine put in it for a customer of ours. So um, we decided to throw one of our own engines together in the last minute haste, and um, we had it on the dyno last night at 10pm. 
The car's running on E85 fuel, and we do have it running 2.2 bar today. It would be well into 600 kilowatts at all four wheels. With the FEMI number plates, I think it's one of very few cars that is justified, because if any other car comes up against it, they should really fear it. FEMI may only be a 2.6 litre, but it revs to 10,000 RPM thanks to a CNC ported head and Apex 280 degree camshafts. It stays alive because of a billet crank, Nitto oil pump and Nitto head gasket and makes its power thanks to twin HKS 3037 turbos. It runs through an OS gear and gearbox which has very long gear ratios. Long enough for 300 kilometres an hour at 10,000 RPM in the top of four. Hold on for a wild ride. <laughs> Not a lot of traction out there and it just wheel spins all the way. I can't believe how far the car is actually wheel spinning. But um, yeah, a lot of fun and definitely a handful. Dom was keen to push Fimi even harder and he most certainly did. <laughs> Dom recorded a 10.5 at 234 kilometres per hour and a 0 to 800 metre time of 16 seconds at 270 kilometres per hour. Those speeds could explain the inability to pull up in time. One thing the 2010 Motive GTR Challenge presented by Juice Polishers had a lot of was R32 model skylines. Hey, my name is Mamoon and I'm from Just Engine Management and this is my R32 Skyline GTR. I'm actually using it as a daily driver at the moment. It's pretty much very drivable, it doesn't feel like it's a quick car. It just drives like a standard GTR would because we've retained all the factory parts. Well, the motor is internally standard. It's running an R34 intercooler and it's got a HKS 2530 turbos and it's only 85 and it's, punched, it's putting out about 380 kilowatts at the wheels so it does the job pretty well. Today I expect to just have some bit of fun and see if I can see how the car goes over more than 400 metres. My personal best is an 11.0 at 120 mile per hour and um, that was in my diff for single spinning so I'm hoping I've got a bit more left in it. Well the best advantage would probably be I can take off with less lag and less wheel spin than most other cars that have big power because I don't have that much power but I'll be able to put it down a bit easier maybe off the line. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Williams GTR was super reliable and consistent. He made more passes than any other competitor and all eight of his timed ones were between 11.2 and 11.5. He must have made over 20 passes at the airport and made sure he finished in style. 2010 also saw our first female competitor in the GTR Challenge. Hi, I'm Kat from Canberra and this is my R32 GTR. Being the only girl here is a little bit of pressure but hopefully I'll do us proud. Okay, my car was built in Canberra by Pro Engine and uh, tuned by Corroding Rose and Developments in Sydney. I love everything about my car. I'm a big R32 GTR fan and uh, I've had it for five years. It's just everything. My aspirations and goals for this meeting are just to better my previous times and to come out and have a bit of fun. Um, at the moment I've got a PB of a 12.0 at uh, Western Sydney Dragway. Kat only just got the car back from the shop so was a bit nervous on her first run. So does that pucker up your butthole a little bit? No, that's fine. It's fine? I knew I wasn't going to hit the thing, so I Yeah, it's fine, isn't it? Yeah, no, that's There's fine. no walls like a drag strip. A little bit embarrassing, but... <laughs> <laughs> but she got straight back out there and was determined to beat her personal best and run her first 11-second pass. <laughs> Previous personal best. This is 12.8. And what have you been trying to do all this time? Exactly 11. Guess what you just did? 11.90. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Gearbox Maddie returned this year in his R32, determined to go faster and not break anything. Hey, this, my name's Matt. This is my R32 JDR. Currently makes 400 at the wheels, thanks to Croydon Racing Development. They call me Gearbox Matty, obviously, because I've blown so many gearboxes. Well, basically, um, before we come out last year, I managed to blow three boxes, and on the track day, blew another one. Got a new OS Geek and Gearbox built in the meantime, and haven't been driving it ever since. What we're expecting, basically, is to have no issues today. Well, I'm running a T78 Turbo, um, apart from that, mild cams. Fuel setup, or, well, you know, three pumps in the boot, one internal surge tank. Um, before the event, I actually upgraded lines because my lines were a little bit too small for, you know, for the power that I was making, but um, everything's all good now. Well, that's exactly what I was preparing, just the lines and just got a retune just to see how it was all going. I just want to see how we go today with the Croydon guys, John and, and obviously the other cars that we're bringing in today. We told Maddie to take it easy in practice and for the first few runs, but as usual, he didn't listen. <laughs> Maddie's car must have done over 20 runs in total over two days without one single glitch.
Steve in his low mount turbo equipped R32 was out to have some fun and put on a show. And that he certainly did. did some runs too, and fast ones at that. Back to the original setup, the only difference is we're running E85, no nitrous. Uh, we never had nitrous the first time either, um, but it's a uh, clean fuel and it's fine. It's a 9.2 at 155 mile an hour. Um, we could have leaned the car out a bit more. Uh, it showed 740 kilowatts at the dyno at the time. We probably had 680, maybe 700 when we did the, the pass. You know what, it, it may have hit the eights, but 9.2 is fine and we took it away. It's about time we saw some big cars come, you know, that's what it's all about, getting out here, having a bit of fun, you know, putting up some challenges and away we go. When Jun rolled up to the line, everyone was quiet, watching in anticipation. And after some shakedowns, Jun was ready to rock. like it could have been anything, the car simply shut off due to electrical problems that the boys took care of and Jun was back out the next day to try again. wasn't having any luck, with Jun suffering from a high oil pressure problem which blew out the cam seals and the turbo seal, ending the car's weekend but easily recording a 10.09 second pass. We were dying to see our first 9 second pass at Cootamundra, and if any car could do it, it's RH9 GTR, now owned by John from Hollywood, I mean from Canberra. The car is, you know, special because it drives like a nice street car. No clunking, no rattling, no clutches, no nothing. It's just very nice to drive. Um, and look, the car's gone 840 at about 168 mile an hour in full street trim. The car weighs 1560 something kilos um, with a full ET street radial. No tail shaft issues, no axles, no diffs, no nothing. It just leaves really moderately and hard and it just comes on boost and it just, you know, goes from there. There is no rivalry between me and Rob. You know, Rob and I are great mates. We, we talk to all the time and look, you know, we're here to have fun. Rivalry or not, whoever wins, we're going to have a great weekend. It'll be great fun. So. Considering it was his first real time driving the car in anger, John decided some warm up runs were required. Big moment, 
would we see our first nine second pass at Kudamundra? John's Kudamundra curse continued with the GTR suffering some engine damage eight seconds into the run. But after lifting off early, the car still recorded a 9.59 second run. We finally had it. All right, there's a man we need to talk to. It's John from Hollywood. I mean, sorry, John from Canberra. Now, you've done something very special today. You may have only got one full pass in today, but you did it. You gave us our very first nine second run at Kudamundra. Now, from what you guys were telling me before, you only had eight seconds worth of data, which in theory means you actually only were really on it for sort of eight and a bit seconds, was, yeah, on the yet you still ran a 9.59. Yeah, it was um, 8.1 seconds on the log of um, power when the TPS went back to zero, so... Look, you know what? We're on the runway. That's where you did to get it, mate. Motive, DVD, GDR Challenge 2012 winner. Thanks, mate. Thank you very much. Happy with that? Appreciate it. Thanks to the boys from CMV for, you know building a fantastic car that you know now they have to make it so I don't break it <laughs> uh, but yeah everything good thank you very much and uh, maybe next year or maybe maybe no maybe, mate, I don't know. Don't, nah, no maybe's mate no maybe's only if you organize it I, I am we'll come hi my name's Gordon I'm here with my R32 GDR uh, I'm from Brisbane uh, the cars built and tuned by Mercury Motorsport Makes about 500 kilowatt at all four wheels. And um, I'm here this year to uh, set a time after some gremlins last year. Uh, I've run the car at the drags before. My best time so far is a 10.6 at 130 mile. Um, and uh, I've got a bit more boost in it now, so hopefully I should be able to run a bit quicker time. Dennis Rezzi from Sydney, uh, power tune built the car, we're running about 85% so around the 640 mark at the moment and uh, that's, all I got. that's all I got for you, uh, it's a track car, circuit yeah, Hollinger baby, Hollinger, I think that makes a difference in this car honestly, uh, they're not rumours, they're all true mate, upgraded the turbo for this event and uh, yeah that's it, I've got better tyres, I'm here to have fun. I, I can't, I, look, I'm really honestly going for the 150 mile an hour mark, but time-wise, I, I can't estimate a time because I've never, never done this, so I, I just can't put an estimation on it. First nine second pass of the day, 9.90. Excellent. How you feeling? I'm pumped now, dude. I'm I heard that was low boost. Low boost, brother. Low boost. Go and turn it up. Bring it on. <laughs> Thank you.
So this year we've brought a 32 GDR, taking the engine and gearbox out of Nitto, uh, which is back in Brisbane, uh, and basically trying to build on our success from last year. Uh, we bought this car as a rolling shell, uh, then sat down and with a clean sheet of paper designed up exactly what we've got in front of us. Uh, we wanted something that was lighter, uh, grippier, could fit bigger tyres and basically outperform our 34 GDR from last year. <laughs> yeah, we definitely tried to keep this car a secret, um, you know, with social media and, you know, mobile phones and cameras and pictures and so we really told as few people as we could. You know, we shocked a few people when we showed up. Everyone was expecting an auto 34 GDR uh, and to arrive in the still manual and 32 GDR. Uh, I think it's sort of surprised a few people for sure. Weighing this car, we're weighing in about 1,300 kilos with me in it. Uh, Nitto was 1,720 kilos as we raced it last year, so we're about 420 kilos better off. Because Nitto was so heavy, it had a lot of grip off the line. Uh, so we're just trying to set the 32 up to suit the surface. Uh, if we can get that sorted out, then hopefully it should be hopefully an eight second pass. Uh, I'd like to see around 170 mile an hour, uh, depending how we go with turning the boost up and feeding the power into it. Uh, but yeah, 170 plus would be, would be excellent. You know, did a bit of practice yesterday, no timing. Uh, so we've made a few tweaks overnight and hopefully we can come out and, and lay down a good time. With very little testing of the new chassis, Trent managed to run a low 10 on the very first pass and was into the 9s on only the second pass with a 9.6 at a lowly 144 miles per hour. Clearly much more to come. Fourth pass, Nitto 2 moved into the lead with a 9.2 second pass. But there was more to come. In the drag battle, Nitto 2 gave us the first 170 mile an hour pass in GTR Challenge history. Great. Um, still working on my launches. Uh, we've been fighting a few electrical dramas all day, but we got on top of that. So, you know, we're slowly adding the boost in, and each run's getting better and better. So, you know, the miles there, we just need to get out of the hole a bit better, and we should be good for an eight. <laughs> Footage of five minutes of a gating? about the GTR is its ability to do this. Throw you in your seat off the line and get to a hundred in two gears. Make you feel good. 
came, he delivered. That is how Dom rolls. So I ended up in the grass again, but I think oh, yes. 200 k's through. wasn't enough. Yeah, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't get the quarter mile on that one. But... <laughs> Don't worry, it's still about 11 or 12. <laughs> It's going to be grass, no problems, I'll be fine, it's smooth, I watched where I was going to go. Got on the grass and took off. Jesus, up some speed here, fast. <laughs> yeah. I said, if this doesn't come around soon, I'm going to handbrake it, and I got it under control. So you went well off. <laughs> well off. Oh, well, I was also trying to keep it smooth as well. Like, yeah. I could have got all messy, because I went between, <laughs> the, I went between things the things. Messy. I didn't want to collect the little <laughs> things. I went in between them, and I went to miss some bumps, so... I probably went a bit deeper just to keep it smooth. As your, as your PR agent, you need to keep things PG. You know, you're on I did, I did. <laughs> oh, sorry. I mean, you've got to get that out of the back everywhere. All right. Someone decided to do 160 km an hour, figure eights, four drive. It was him. So, it was fun. It's meant to be driven, so you drive it. That's it. Like, a lot of people own cars and they don't drive them. I like to drive them. You know, you give them 100% and... If they hold together, you know you got a good car. Later, later. Leave me for last. I hear that you're a little bit camera shy sometimes. Nah, not me. Never. Yeah, yeah have you seen it? Have you seen the paparazzi? <laughs> Bang, man.